Welcome to Occupy Brooklyn TV. I'm Melanie Butler. And I'm Kitane Andrews. Here's an overview of our stories today. Pepper spraying cops get the official thumbs down in California and New York. Green resistance continues to break out everywhere. We'll look at actions in Vermont and West Virginia fighting big coal and fracking. The London Olympics are the site of ongoing protests and record level policing. While on both coasts of the USA, police and FBI agents raid the homes of protesters in what is being called a witch hunt against anarchists. And finally, as we continue to spotlight the good work of local activist groups, we'll take a look at Take Back the Land and the fight against foreclosures. Students at the University of California, Davis, are rejoicing over the official departure of former campus police officer, Lieutenant John Pike, better known as the Pepper Spray Cop. Pike drew outrage from around the world last November after he was caught on video pepper spraying a group of UC Davis students who were staging a peaceful demonstration against the school's tuition hikes. The video, which shows Pike callously firing the chemical spray directly into the eyes of students seated just a few feet in front of him, soon went viral. According to the Sacramento Bee, Pike received a barrage of more than 10,000 angry text messages and 17,000 email complaints after his personal information was leaked over the internet by the hacker group and close Occupy ally Anonymous. UC Davis spokesman Barry Schiller confirmed that Pike's employment with the university officially ended on Tuesday, July 31st, but declined any further comment. The pepper spray cop had been on paid administrative leave for the eight months since the incident occurred. In 2010, Pike's annual salary was listed as $110,000. A task force established to investigate the incident determined in April that Pike's actions were objectively unreasonable, stating that, quote, On balance, there is little factual basis supporting Lieutenant Pike's belief that he was trapped by the protesters or that his officers were prevented from leaving the quad. Further, there is little evidence that any protesters attempted to use violence against the police, end quote. Their report concluded, quote, the pepper spraying incident that took place on November 18, 2011, should and could have been prevented." End quote. Michael Risher, a staff attorney with the American Civil Liberties Union, told the Los Angeles Times earlier this year that using military-grade pepper spray and police violence against nonviolent student protesters isn't just wrong, it also directly violates the Constitution. Risher stated, quote, when the cost of speech is a shot of blinding, burning pepper spray in the face, speech is not free." End quote. In what might be seen as a happy coincidence, the city of New York has announced it will not be paying the legal fees of its most famous pepper spraying cop, Anthony Bologna. Bologna is being sued by two Occupy Wall Street protesters he pepper sprayed last fall. The incident was captured in a viral video. A city official estimated that such a refusal happens in less than 5% of federal civil rights cases against cops. The police union will foot Bologna's legal bill. Last week saw the convergence of activists from New England and Northeastern Canada in Burlington, Vermont, in protest of the planned construction of a 750 mile long oil pipeline, which would bring to the Northeast the tar sands of central Canada. The plan, which was discussed without public input at the annual meeting of New England governors, would result in the decimation of 180 miles of New Hampshire forest and would put the most densely populated urban areas of the county at risk of an ecological and public health disaster. A group of 500 protesters marched through downtown Burlington and descended upon the conference center and created a human oil spill blocking traffic into the building after which they peacefully dispersed without incident. More troubling was the response by the Burlington Police Department to a separate action at the conference center later that Sunday. A small group of activists attempted to blockade the delegation from leaving the center for dinner. After what was alleged by the police department to be threatening behavior on behalf of the protesters, rubber bullets and tear gas were deployed which reportedly injured six. Police came, claimed protesters physically confronted officers. However, keep in mind that no activists were arrested in this incident. On Saturday, July 28th, 
Over 50 protesters took part in a historic shutdown of Hobet Mine, the largest mountaintop removal coal mining site in West Virginia. The action was organized by the group Radical Action for Mountain People's Survival, or RAMPS. Ten of the protesters locked themselves to a rock truck, boarding the truck to display a banner that read, Coal Leaves, Cancer Stays. The slogan was a reference to the environmental and health consequences of mountaintop removal mining, as well as the increasing amount of coal being exported from Appalachia to foreign countries. Mountaintop removal mining severely impacts biodiversity and toxifies nearby watersheds, and has resulted in environmental disasters over ten times the size of the Exxon Valdez oil spill. People who live in mountaintop removal mining communities are twice as likely to develop cancer and have a greater risk of birth defects, respiratory illnesses, and other chronic heart, lung, and kidney diseases. Mountain justice advocates also criticize the political influence of the coal industry, which they say poses a threat to workers and unions and has blocked development of other industries that could create more sustainable employment in the region. Dustin Steele, one of the activists who took part in the Hobet Mine shutdown, said, quote, The government has aided and abetted the coal industry in evading environmental and mine safety regulations. We are here today to demand that the government and coal industry end strip mining, repay their debt to Appalachia, and secure a just transition for this region, end quote. Organizers claim that several protesters were threatened with chainsaws during the action and that Dustin Steele was dragged across a sidewalk and punched and kicked by state troopers while in police custody. Steele, who identifies as queer and is a native of Matewan, West Virginia, was arrested during the action along with 19 other protesters. Speaking after the action, Steele said, quote, my desire to struggle and organize for the future of the people and environment in West Virginia has never been stronger. And just like my grandfather fought with all of his allies, I will continue to fight for an end of mountaintop removal for the future generations of this state." End quote. Ten of the so-called Hobet 20 were released as part of a plea deal on Thursday, August 2nd. For updates on the activists' current status and to donate to their legal fund, visit rampscampaign.org. A few days before the action at Hobet Mine, two Occupy Wall Street activists, Kathleen Russell and Amelia H.M., met with mountain activists in the area as part of their Radical Resistance Tour, a road trip project highlighting the work of Occupy sites and other activist movements around the country. Here's footage from their visit to West Virginia. If we don't attack this problem at its root, which is what Occupy is doing, and I'm really you know, thankful for that, that somebody's working on it and doing you know, anti-capitalist uh, work pretty much. You know, if we win here, then there's just going to be some other industry swoop in and take its place. We're all fighting the same enemy, just you know, different faces of the same enemy. You know, we may be focusing on you know, that's the coal industry here in southern West Virginia, but that's just another tentacle of this giant beast. As the Olympic Games continue in London, so have the protests and large-scale militarized policing. Demonstrators at the Games will have to contend with a 553 million pound security operation, the largest mounted in peacetime Britain, involving 12,000 police, 23,700 security personnel, 7,500 Ministry of Defense staff, and 13,500 military personnel in order to protect the 34 venues and more than 60 non-competition games venues from terrorist and civil threats. There are missiles on top of London apartments, spy drones, warships, LRAD sonic weaponry, and even the potential downing of airliners authorized by British officials, including Prime Minister David Cameron. The police have been granted additional powers to combat protesters during the Games, with clauses in the London Olympic Games and Games Act of 2006 seemingly giving officers the ability to seize placards and political posters and even enter private homes to seize protest materials. Before the Games even got started, mass arrests had been made. London police used pepper spray against a critical mass, Cycle Ride. There had been calls on the internet to stage the London ride on July 27th as an anti-Olympics protest. But why are there protests? 
Politics is involved in decisions about hosting the games and about which countries can participate. It is precisely because sports seem to be neutral that it is so effective to use them for political purposes. Then there's the cost. The bill funded by the public is a staggering 9.3 billion pounds and this is in a time of economic hardship and austerity measures. In addition to the 80,000 seat stadium and other sporting venues, the projects include an athlete's village of elegant cream colored apartments with glass balconies and polished woodwork set in sculpted parkland, most of them in Newham, north of the River Thames. Newham is also ground zero of a British housing crisis that has grown acute since the 2008 financial crash. The credit crunch reduced UK home building last year to the lowest peacetime level in nine decades. The Department of Culture, Media and Sports says, quote, The benefits from hosting the games are major in social, economic and sporting terms and will be a boost to the country, end quote. Some cities like Montreal might disagree. It took taxpayers there 30 years to help pay off the debt that amassed from hosting the 1976 games. And there have been the theories that the Athens 2004 Olympics may have contributed to Greece's financial catastrophe. The games, with their image as the ultimate sporting event, are a marketer's dream for reaching a global audience and is big business for television networks, advertisers, and Olympic sponsors. British author and filmmaker Ian Sinclair stated, the only water you are allowed to buy at the games is sold by Coca-Cola. The only food you are allowed to buy is McDonald's. The access to the site is through the Westfield Shopping Mall. It is like an invasion. Critics, including boxer Amir Khan, find it galling that a nation fighting obesity will have a giant fast food outlet at the heart of its greatest sporting event. McDonald's restaurant on the Olympic Park is the biggest in the world and can seat 1,500 people but could easily accommodate 500 more if necessary. It will operate for six weeks, serving an estimated 50,000 Big Mac burgers and 180,000 portions of fries. Initially, 2012 was going to be the greenest games until organizers realized this promise could not be kept. For example, they said it would be an opportunity to clean up the contaminated area on the Eastway cycle track, which contains radioactive materials. But rather than clean up the site, works have spread the contamination far and wide and include the deliberate and illegal burial of radioactive contaminants in the Olympic Park, 250 meters away from the main stadium, according to GamesMonitor.org researcher Mike Wells. In a clip from Wells' short film, London Takes Gold, Peter Frankenthal, Economic Program Relations Director at Amnesty International, had this to say about some of the companies the International Olympic Committee decided to accept as sponsors. The London 2012 Organising Committee is a public body in receipt of public funds, and they're behaving in many ways like a commercial organisation entering into contracts without considering the ethical dimension of these contracts. Um, I think they should have a, uh, an ethical procurement policy. They have become tainted um, by the human rights abuses linked to um, some of their sponsors, and that's become a major problem for London 2012. Sponsors such as Dow Chemical, Rio Tinto, BP, companies that have been linked to environmental damage, to human rights abuses, and by entering into a relationship with these companies without properly considering their impacts on human rights and the environment, they become tainted by some of these impacts and associations. It's a branding issue. Occupy Public Access TV is a newly emerging network of community news shows produced and broadcast by ordinary citizens on public access television. We seek to create a network of independently operated shows working cooperatively, sharing content, news, labor, resources, and practical experience. We take advantage of the broadcast quality facilities made available by the Brooklyn Public Access Television Studios to produce and broadcast our show, and we encourage other Occupy groups around the city and around the country to do the same. Editorial meetings take place online, and we encourage newcomers to join in the conversation. 
We're seeking people who can speak on issues and news items of current significance. Tips for local breaking news stories are always welcome. We're also looking for people to get involved with all aspects of the show. You can participate in the conversation about producing the show by joining our public Google group and saying hello. Episodes are made available for viewing through our website, but community media is not a spectator sport, so find a way to get involved. The FBI has been conducting a campaign of intimidating visits to the homes of activists affiliated with Occupy and anarchist groups. The agency has at times used overwhelming force, but has yet to make a single arrest in any of these visits. In the early morning of July 10th in Seattle, activists were awoken by the sound of their door being broken down and a flashbang grenade tossed into their home. Here's how Philip Neal later described the incident to Russia Times. We were woken up at like 5.50 something. It was close to, you know, still close to 4th of July and people have been setting off fireworks. So um, I actually thought it was fireworks at first and then I thought, oh, those are really close fireworks. And then uh, it clicked within a few minutes um, what was actually going on. Uh, I had enough time to basically jump up, get some clothes on, and uh, get on my knees with my hands behind my head. Uh, right after that, my door was opened and an uh, armed uh, SWAT, uh, uh, member of the SWAT team from the Seattle Police Department came in uh, with his automatic rifle, basically stood behind me with the automatic rifle trained on my upper back for a few minutes while they searched the rest of the house. Uh, my girlfriend was sitting on the bed, uh, same situation with her with another uh, one of the SWAT team people. And uh, then they zip tied us, took us into the main room. The search warrant explicitly stated that the team of FBI agents and local police were looking for, quote, anarchist material, end quote. They seized clothing and notebooks. Two weeks later, on the 25th, more joint FBI police SWAT teams appeared at multiple homes in Seattle, Portland, and Olympia. They served grand jury subpoenas and seized computers, anarchist literature, black flags, and clothing. In one such early morning raid in Portland, the agents even used a helicopter, waking up the neighbors, only to discover the anarchists they sought had moved out of the residence more than a year earlier. Warrants for the searches are sealed, which means they're not on public record. This concealment of police activity is permitted by the City of Portland's joining of the Joint Terrorism Task Force. A group quickly formed to protest the raids and grand jury proceedings. Called the Committee Against Political Repression, the group wrote a solidarity statement that was signed by 160 groups. They described the campaign as a witch hunt against anarchists. At a press conference on August 1st, two of the activists served with subpoenas, Dennison Williams and Leah Lynn Platt, announced that they would refuse to give the grand jury any information but their names, risking being charged with contempt of court. The next day, no charges were levied against them, but they were issued more subpoenas. On the same day Philip Neal and his comrades had their door broken down, FBI agents paid a visit to OWS activist Yanni Brombacher Miller here in Brooklyn. Miller wasn't at home, so his mother had to deal with the authorities. We spoke to Miller about the incident. If they do a, if they do a raid or something, I mean, they're going to find even more information about you, or they're going to possibly uh, entrap you or um, add additional charges or bring perhaps a grand jury where they would have, um, where you didn't per se do anything wrong, but uh, you potentially witness something, and if you refuse to cooperate for those uh, grand juries, that in itself is a contempt for uh, court, and that in itself results in jail time. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, it's one thing, you know, being known that you're being surveilled, it's another knowing that you can be incarcerated for it, too. And then the next morning, they call again at 6 a.m., Again, uh, my mother uh, picked up, and you know they asked uh, if I was home, if they knew where I was. Uh, she didn't. Was I part of any other groups? Uh, they didn't specify what groups, and they said that they were here to uh, investigate what happened in Chicago. What my version of the story was, what is the Chicago police version of the story, and like how can we work together? It seems like quite a bit of time has passed since uh, they last they last contacted you, and they haven't been back in any way. No, they have not. Interesting. And it, part of it might be because um, since I work on the tweet boat um, under Occupy Wall SDNYC on Twitter, 
um, you know, I've made it very public about these visits. You know, I'm not ashamed at all that they have, and um, any attempts they have to chill me or to intimidate me, I haven't taken it that way. Instead, I've publicized it and I used it as part of my political work in exposing the repression of the uh, federal agencies. Also in New York, OWS activist Billy Livesey was twice visited by FBI agents at his home in the last week of July. The agents pre presented him with a dossier of information they had been compiling on him and other activists, including political actions of his, all perfectly legal, from 20 years earlier. They asked him questions about the upcoming actions about, at the Republican National Convention and said, you can talk now or we can take you in. Livesey called their bluff, refused to speak, and the agents took no action. However, Livesey's landlady was so frightened by the incident that she reneged on their handshake work trade deal, and Livesey found himself without work or a home. The Take Back the Land movement is a national network of organizations promoting campaigns dedicated to housing as a human right and securing local control over land. The organization seeks to question the legality of land ownership in a time when public money was used to rescue banks in order to preserve fortunes for private institutions and individuals. Calling on citizens' basic sense of morality, Take Back the Land asserts that the foreclosed land is now public and should be used to address the housing crisis. Recent campaigns in coordination with Occupy Our Homes have assisted numerous homeowners facing eviction by publicizing the facts of their eviction on a national level. Persons are then urged to call the bank prepared with details requesting that they rescind the foreclosure. Other campaigns have sought to liberate homes by defending homeowners from police eviction with rallied support by community members. Take Back the Land tracks the success of the campaigns by documenting the actions and their results. Here is a short segment from a talk given last week by Max Rameau of the Take Back the Land at the Summer Institute for the Center of Popular Economics. So to be perfectly clear, what Take Back the Land uh, has been doing since 2006 is we've been identifying vacant government-owned and foreclosed homes. We break into them and we move homeless people into peopleless homes. And then when they're found, we physically blockade and prevent the police from evicting them. And this we call land liberation and eviction defense or positive action campaigns. When we engage these positive action campaigns, we are doing at least two things. One is we are actively opposing immoral laws. And those are the immoral laws that state that banks have the right to own tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands, or the US government has the right to own 250,000 vacant homes uh, while human beings live out on the street or doubling and tripling up with their family members. So we are actively opposing those immoral laws. At the same time, we are also implementing what we consider to be moral laws. We think it is moral and good and just that if you have a family that needs a home and you have a home that doesn't have any family living in them, that the homeless family is moved into the house that doesn't have a family into it. We think these are good and just laws and those are the laws that we want to implement whether or not we get assistance from the government or from private uh, uh, interests. Uh, in addition to engaging in these actions, or rather as a result of engaging in these types of actions, we've been able to see what the real life impact of these practical, of these, uh, uh, of these positive action campaigns has been in a real practical way and even in, a, uh, in an economic way. The first action that we engaged in, Take Back the Land, was in October of 2006 when, the, when gentrification was still going, when housing prices were still going up. In Miami, in the Liberty City section of Miami, uh, housing prices were doubling and tripling just about every year. Uh, and of course it was forcing the removal of low income black community from that historically black community. Uh, it d absolutely devastated uh, uh, that community. And while this was happening, most people expected that the government, when there was a housing crisis, would intercede and alleviate the housing crisis by making more affordable housing available. But in fact the government was doing the exact opposite. It was exacerbating the housing crisis by implementing laws, policies, and uh, incentives which encouraged the building of housing that low-income people could not afford and encouraged the moving out 
of low-income people, particularly low-income people of color. So the U.S. government and the uh, city of Miami and the and Miami-Dade County jointly were, uh, were put a vacant piece of land on the corner of 62nd Street and Northwest 17th Avenue in the Liberty City section of Miami, up for bid uh, to developers. But they didn't ask for bid for money. This was public land, but instead of asking for money, the city and the county just said any developer who can prove they have enough cash on hand to build a condo within six months can have the land for free. So here we are, communities suffering from lack of housing, and not only is the government giving away public land rather than building something on it that the local community can use, but it's giving it away only to those who are too wealthy to live in that neighborhood and only to those who are too wealthy to live in that neighborhood and willing to build things that people who live in that neighborhood would not be able to afford uh, once it's completed. So. Uh, on October 23rd, 2006, a group of us seized control of that land and we built an urban shanty town there. And it became known as the Emoja Village Shanty Town. And we housed 150 people, 150 homeless people, uh, about 50 at a time, over the course of six months. Uh, but during that, it was an amazing uh, experience and uh, an amazing experiment not only in uh, in positive action campaigns, but also in direct democracy, where the people who lived there, lived on that uh, in, at the Emotion Village, were able to make their own rules about how their society ran. Uh, it, was, it was a fascinating study in how people make decisions when they're in certain situations. And end up writing a book about it, I have the book here about uh, Emotion Village. But the, the, most, the, most, the thing that I felt had the longest um, uh, term implications for us and most applicable here was that we found that street homeless people, people who were one day stepped over by society and who were forced to commit street level crimes on a constant basis in order to have enough to eat, in order to find a place to live. And were struggling and fighting all the time with, uh, uh, with other street homeless people and with themselves, really. Once they were given a place to live there at the Emoja Village, and they weren't charged for it, and we told them that they would have food every time that they were there, when they were, in other words, given housing security and food security, it changed their lives forever. That's our show for today. Thanks so much for watching. See you next week.